about with the spirit of the story. And of course, one of the challenges was she, in the middle of the production, of course, she passed away in 2014. So we never got that opportunity to go back for one or two more interviews. So what Rita was referring to, we had to dig deeper and find uh, archival interviews that would help fill in the gap, because obviously there's no narrator in the film, so it was a challenge. Uh, but it was, a, you know, it was a great creative challenge, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Makes me proud to be an American. I don't say that too often, but it does tonight. Uh, but I wanted to ask each of you what that one thing, that one gift, that one idea that Maya gave to you individually. Could everybody hear his question? He's asking us what individually one gift that Maya gave to us, I guess, as individuals. As, as individuals. Start with that. Uh, I would have to say that I worked for Maya Angelou with uh, Oprah Radio. She was one of my radio hosts, and uh, that was from 2006 to 2010. And while I was working in radio, I had previously done documentaries and continued to do them, and I realized that I was listening to history that from 1928, her birth, then the Jim Crow South, and then to go to St. Louis in 1935, which was the Great Migration, to go out to California to be a part of the Harlem Writers Movement, to live in Cairo, and to live in Ghana, that, uh, and to travel with the State Department all around the world with Porgy and Bess, that here was a person who had lived history, documented history, participated in it, and she needed to have a documentary done on her life to just honor all of that work. In the process of doing that, what I really found was that as much as had happened to her, she still had joy and she had a lot of forgiveness in her spirit. So the, the first thing that she said, you must encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. When we came across that quote, that's what she taught me was not to be defeated and that in fact what seemed like it might be defeating me might actually define who I was. So personally that was the gift. Thank you. I guess I would echo that. <clears throat> I think that her story is mainly a story of inspiration at a time when we need more inspiration frankly. And I hope my goal for the film would be to reach young people with the film and that they could see what she went through but she overcame tremendous obstacles, and as Rita said, came, overcame these obstacles with grace and dignity and a sense of humor even. And so I think young people watch this film, they have struggles that they're going through, and they see she overcame rape at age seven. She overcame the vicious racism of the Jim Crow cell. She overcame being a woman in a man's world and many other things, and still was a creative force of nature. So I think that's an incredible lesson, and I think we need people like that. That's why I think the film is important, because she's gone, but hopefully the film will continue on and will continue to deliver that message. Yes. Um, just as a sort of media, I think you mentioned it up with all of the Oscars, does that lend to this type of urgency for this film? Do you think that this film plays a role in maybe the future of film and that Dr. Angelo has an opportunity for that voice to ring out for a future for this medium. I, I, go ahead. I'm not clear on the question though, what was? I, I think yes. I know what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Did yes. everyone hear her? The Oscars and the lack yeah. of diversity oh, in the Oscars. Okay. Does this lend a sense of yeah. urgency to mm. this film and the, the meaning behind your project? Okay. If you take a look at the fact that she was the first black woman in the DGA, so the Directors Guild, that was, you know, that was in the 80s. And now the Directors Guild, you know, as a black female member of the DGA myself, the struggle is still very, very real. Um, in production, even inside the, uh, not just the studios, but when you work, often as women, your thoughts and ideas can simply be dismissed. It's systemic. And that happens for blacks too. I would say you fight for every scene. You keep working. You do your best at it. 
And the spirit of things in this country will definitely have to change. And I think that's happening with the Academy. I think it's appropriate that this film is out. Obviously, it was four years in the making, so nobody knew unless you count everybody. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad situation to have to work in conditions where the rubric is a mess. I mean, let's, you know, if, if, if what you're being defined by is by a group that does not take you seriously, then you have an uphill battle. <coughs> that's not just, a, I want to be clear, that's not just white men. And that's not just, you know, there are black women who look at other black women and other races that look at people and dismiss what women's thoughts are and what black's thoughts are. And until we get past that, we're not past it. There's a point that Maya Angelou did for the United Nations, and she said, when we get to it, and only when we get to it. And that's the issue. We're, we haven't got to it yet. I think she, you can see in the film that she, uh, she always advocated, take action, protest, go to the streets, do the work, you know, don't just talk about it. And uh, that was something we were, thought was very important to show uh, different cases of that. Her son Guy talks eloquently about that. Um, so that's part of it, is you can't just talk about or theorize about it. She would say, take it to the streets, or the metaphorical street in this case. Anything, uh, other questions from the audience? Yes? How's your son doing this long? You know, people ask us that. If you see in that one picture where he's standing up um, in, in that group shot with Paul DeFeur, um, he did walk again. Um, unfortunately, from that accident, there was another, and he's had over 57 back operations, oh. and so his, um, his, it became degenerative. And so he's been in a wheelchair now for maybe the last 20 years, but he did walk again after that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for making it. It was just beautiful. And I was so struck with how many um, stars, uh, people with star power you have in this movie talking about Miss Angelou. Can you say a little bit about how you enrolled them in this project yeah, I mean, they, they are in the film because they're stars. They're in the film because they were organic to the story. They were colleagues of Dr. Angelo's, or family in some cases, friends. So we weren't tr trying to make a film that was star-studded. It just so happens that her life intersected with all these people, and they were key figures. Uh, President Clinton, uh, Com, and all, you know, Quincy Jones, all those people were integral to her life. So they, you know, hopefully we weave them in and it all made sense, um, so that was clearly not our intention, but you know, it, it was fun to have those people and to be able to interview them. You know, I think the greatest thing about that is they were all great storytellers. Uh -huh. They are all great storytellers. I just, you could just, we could just sit there in the edit suite and listen to them tell their stories, and you know, the challenge was, of course, we couldn't use all of that, but... Uh, DVD extras, DVD extras. <laughs> you will be able to see some of that. I think you also have to look at the fact that at the time that she came up, when you saw the blacks, Cicely Tyson, uh, all of those people, Lou Gossett, were not known. They were, all, they were all starting out. They were little known actors. The places where she happened to be attracted that type of audience and those type of friendships that lasted over time and then as she became um, as voiced in her own purpose she drew these people to her she mentored people and at the same time she wanted to stay current so she wrote things that we don't have she wrote the poem when Michael Jackson died and knew his mother people came to her she uh, made sure that uh, Queen Latifah and, and what we don't have in here is she was a country music aficionado. She opened for Martina McBride and a um, uh, couple of uh, people, I think it was, uh, you know, whether it was Cowboy Troy or people would send her a guitar, Montgomery Gentry, and she's in some of their videos. She wanted to keep current 
with everybody who was out there. And I think she, because of the things that happened to her, she sincerely opened her heart to respect other people. And it was hard won, but it was cross racial lines and all that. And that just came through. Uh, any other questions? Because you've got one in already, but uh, go ahead. Uh, the part that of the film that most spoke to me was when she went to Jimmy Baldwin and he asked her why she wouldn't, she wouldn't marry the man she was in love with. Right, and at the, a, white man. a white man. And at that height of black separatism, I remember Odetta adopted a white child. Mm. And I wondered, for each of you, what that kind of courage to speak against the wind, to do something, because we see Maya in that scene cop to the fact that she's afraid. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the friendship and the love, she was able to listen and, and change. I just want to say thank you for including that scene. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because her first husband was white at a time when she really didn't think that white and black people could ever have relationships that were love relationships. And then, you know, um, I would kind of joke that she went, uh, you know, she went Greek and then she went to Africa and then she came <laughs> back to America with a, you to know, a with a Brit. Uh, and then the guy was fat and she was like, oh, really he is? I mean, I think she got to the point where it was about people. And she also was so honest to say, you know, I'm human too. I, I now know what interracial is and maybe I don't want to do this. But she always walked through her own fears and found her voice. And I think women in particular are always on a mission to find their voices. And uh, men may be too, I just don't happen to have that, uh, <laughs> I don't happen to have that understanding. We are. Thank you. <laughs> so you're, you're finding your voice, and I think she had to find that in love like she had to find it in her work. Let me just add one thing. I was talking to Colin Johnson, who's been with us, but he couldn't be here tonight. He's her grandson. And uh, he, we were talking about this the other day, because I'm always amazed, how did Maya Angelou do all these things? And he said in a word, fearlessness. That she was fearless. And most of us are not that strong and not that fearless. That, you know, if you had an opportunity to make a decision in a couple weeks to go to Egypt, out of the blue, and to essentially go to Africa, she did it. But I don't think, I, I think if I did a poll, most of us would not have that kind of fearlessness of spirit. So that led her through that incredible journey, was not planned. But she had an openness and a fearlessness that allowed her to do all those things and intersect with all those amazing people. Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, you know, all those people. That Very was amazing. few people during that time period would have a relationship with both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X because they were, they were at such opposite ends of their thoughts. But she was a bridge for that. And so she remained... Um, being that bridge in the culture, and she always wanted to be that. One more question? Anybody else? Well, thank you very much, everybody.